Okay, this one is concerning the building blocks of some of the profit maximizing stuff that we talk about in McConnell and Micro through chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 even. We're going to just go over a bunch of definitions here, some concepts that you're going to use over and over and over again in those chapters. First of all, way up at the top here, profit. Profit is equal to total revenue minus total costs, which I think a lot of people say, yeah, duh, that's probably something that most of us understand pretty intuitively. Let's talk very specifically about what goes into those revenue and what goes into those costs ideas. Total revenue in your book and in most of what we're going to be doing up here is usually abbreviated TR. And total revenue equals price times quantity. The amount that you sell, the quantity, times the price that you charge for each one of those. So price times quantity. AR here is average revenue, and we're going to define that as your total revenue divided by your quantity. So it's revenue per unit. MR in your textbook is defined as marginal revenue, which is the change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity. Remember that delta, that mathematical symbol that looks like the little triangle is means change. So what this says is, as I sell one more, as I change quantity by one, how much does my total revenue go up by? You hope it goes up. How much does my total revenue change by? So it's change in total revenue divided by change in quantity. That's the marginal revenue. Okay? Now let's go over here and talk about costs for a minute. I've got up at the top of the board explicit versus implicit costs. We're going to hold off on that idea for just a moment. Underneath that, though, we have TC, total cost, equals FC plus VC. Total costs are equal to fixed plus variable costs. Now, fixed costs are a special idea here in, in microeconomics. Fixed costs are those which don't change as the quantity produced or the organization changes. So that, for example, if you shut down a business, if you shut down the college here, there are some costs that will go on even though no one's here, no one's working, no one's producing anything. Uh, a common example is insurance. You still have to pay to insure the facility even if you shut down, you're not holding classes, you're not producing your product. Your rent or your mortgage payments, some minimal electrical payments are often part of the fixed costs. So that's the first one. FC is fixed cost. Total cost equals fixed cost plus variable costs, and that's the other kind. Those are the costs that do change when quantity changes. The common one is labor. If you want to increase more product, you have to hire more people. If you want to increase the production of, of whatever it is you're making, you have to hire more inputs like the raw materials. If you're printing books, you have to get more paper, more ink, more glue, more material for the binding. So those are all variable costs. If you've worked for a while and you've been in organizations, you might start to think of some examples that you're not sure that fit into one or the other category. Some of those are going to have a combination of characteristics of both, and your textbook calls those quasi-fixed costs. That is a cost that is part variable and part fixed, and that's fine. Okay. Now back here, we're going to talk about a couple more definitions that are associated with costs. This one is average total costs. It's usually called ATC, but sometimes you'll see it as just plain old average cost, AC. That sometimes is the abbreviation for it. And that simply equals total cost divided by quantity. That's your per unit cost. Another marginal one for you, marginal cost is equal to change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. Similar to the marginal revenue one that we talked about just over here a moment ago, what this one says is as you produce more, as your quantity changes, what happens to your cost? If I produce one more, how much does my total cost change by? Now notice, that's an average, and this is kind of looks the same. Same variables in the denominator and the numerator, but they're really different. This is just the level of total cost divided by the level of quantity. This one is the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. So they're capturing fundamentally different ideas. We'll also, in some of these chapters, look at the difference between average variable cost and average fixed cost. That's taking the pieces of total cost, fixed and variable, and dividing them through by quantity. So average variable cost will give us per unit variable cost. Average fixed cost will give us per unit fixed cost. Okay. 
Now, looking back up here at explicit and implicit costs, let's go over here and think about an example uh, about what the differences between these two ideas are, because this is kind of important to a lot of what we're going to do in chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. In economics, we talk about a couple of different ideas of, of costs, sort of conceptual ideas. An explicit cost is one of them, and that's a cost that has a dollar component that you're often going to be writing a check for. If you're working for me in my firm, I'm going to be writing you a check every two weeks or every month for your wages, for your salaries. That's an explicit cost. If I had run a pizza shop downtown in Harrisonburg, I'm going to be writing a check for the guys who supply me for the dough and the tomatoes and the mozzarella and everything else. Those are all explicit costs. But there are also implicit costs associated with producing a product. Now, I'm going to give you an example to show you what I mean. Suppose that we have a company that produces bikes. And this company is known for a really high quality level of bike. Okay? They have a capacity in their factory to produce about 100,000 bikes a year. Right now, they're doing pretty well. They're selling 80,000. Not $80,000, but 80,000 bikes. So they've got a little excess capacity, but they're doing just fine. Now suppose that they get presented with a really interesting deal from one of the big box retailers, like perhaps Walmart. Walmart comes in and says to them, I want to make a deal. I want you to make for me 50,000 bikes a year. Okay? Out of those 50,000 bikes a year, I want you to stamp on them your name, and we're going to sell them in Walmart. Now, these really high quality, kind of high end, sort of a little expensive bikes are going to be sold in Walmart with the same company's name on them. And they're going to be sold at Walmart for a little less money. So what Walmart is basically saying to these guys is, we want you to make a bike that's kind of not quite as high quality as the one that you're making, the one that your customers associate with your name. We want you to make them for us and we're going to sell them in our stores for you and we're going to put your name on them. Now the company thinks about this. Well, it's Walmart, right? That's a pretty good deal. That really gets your name out there uh, in the community, in the market, in a way that is kind of hard to beat. But there are some costs associated with doing this. One cost might be, hmm, if I make 50,000 bikes that are of lower quality for Walmart and I let Walmart sell them and put my name on it, I'm not going to have capacity enough to sell those 80,000 bikes that I've been making over the last few years. Right? I have enough to make 50 of my high quality bikes and sell them out in that market, but I don't have enough capacity right now to make 80,000. So one of the costs, the implicit costs, of making this deal with Walmart are the bikes that I won't be able to make my high quality product that I've been making for all these years, and I won't be able to sell them out in the market like I had before. Another implicit cost the company might want to consider is that if they've been selling high quality bikes for years, and they've got a really good association of good quality with their name, and they start selling lower quality bikes in Walmart, what happens to all of those wonderful brand associations that have been going along with their name all along? Do people start to associate their, their their name, their brand, with bikes that might not last as long, that might have paint that chips, that might break down more often, that might simply not be as good quality a product. Those are two examples of the implicit costs that we also worry about in economics and are associated with the idea not only of explicit costs, the kind you write checks for, the kind you report to the IRS, but implicit costs as well. Okay? So, Microeconomics, McConnell, concepts that are scattered all throughout chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11.